Good morning and welcome to Bethlehem Christian Church as we turn our hearts to the Lord on this Mother's Day weekend. We recognize and we honor and remember all mothers living and those that have gone before us. Happy Mother's Day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and ever be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I pray today that each of you may continue to dwell in the confident faith of God's love which passes all understanding. Let us pray together. Lord of life and overcomer of death, we seek your presence at this time as we begin our worship. Without you, O oh God, our worship is just some empty form, but with you it becomes life transforming. And communion with the source of creation. Enter our worship now, O oh Lord, and make it real. For it's in Jesus' name that we would pray. Amen.
I'm happy. I sing because I'm What is today? If all my children were here, they'd say, it's Mother's Day. I brought some jokes today about mothers. The kid said, why is a computer so smart? And mother said, because it listens to its motherboard. The kid said, Daddy, do you know the difference between a pack of cookies and a pack of elephants? Daddy said, no. The child said, it's a good thing Mama does the grocery shopping. <laughs> Mom said, eat your carrots. They're good for you. And the child said, how do you know? Mom said, have you ever seen a rabbit wearing glasses? And then Mom says, I'm warning you, if you fall out of that tree and break both your legs, don't come running to me. Oh, come on, Mom. How in the world could we do that? Mama, you gave me a foundation built on faith and love and taught me to believe in God and dreams. Everything I am that I've become is all because of you. All that I will ever be, I owe it all to you, Mom, for you gave me roots and wings. Isn't that a familiar verse that most of us have grown up with? M is for the million things she gave me. O means only that she's growing old. T is for the tears she shed to save me. H is for her heart of purest gold. E is for her eyes with love light shining. R means real and right shall always be. Put them all together, they spell mother. A word that means the world to me. And we know somebody's always watching. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator, and I immediately wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake for me, and I learned that the little things in life can be very special. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make a meal and take it to a friend who was sick. And I learned what it means to serve one another in brotherly love. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you pray over me and kiss me goodnight. And I felt loved and safe. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw how you handled your responsibilities, even when you didn't feel good. And I learned what it means to glorify God in all things. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you give up your time and money to the church and people in need. And I learned that God loves a cheerful giver. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw some tears come to your eyes. And I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared and I wanted to be everything I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you, I saw you praying and reading God's word and I learned to depend on and trust him too. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked at you and wanted to say, thanks mom for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. May we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God our Father. 
Your mercies are new every morning and we thank you for bringing us to this new day. And we thank you for the gift of sleep and for the blessing of a Sabbath rest. We thank you, O oh God, for health and strength and for the confidence that faith bestows. We thank you for those who love us and for those whom we love and for your steadfast love that surrounds us all. By the example of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, O oh God, lead us in ways that glorify you for your many gifts to us. Lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And when our days are heavy with burdens and long with labors, Lord, stay close to us and stay beside us. Let faith and hope and love, O oh God, take root and let it grow among us. We pray this morning, O oh Lord, for all the first responders who continue to serve in so many ways. We thank you for the church as it reaches out in the name of Christ our Lord. Remember those that are sick, the shut-ins as well, and the experiencing those experiencing difficulty in our community and throughout this world. We thank you for the home. We thank you for the gift of mothers. The example of mothers, Lord, that's been lifted up. Those that are living and we remember those that have gone before us to their eternal home. Lead us ever by the power of your spirit, for it's in Jesus' name that we would pray. Amen. Good morning, since today is such a special day and as we remember mothers, I thought I'd like to share with something that warmed my heart once. A few years ago, Willis Moore wrote an article for the Upper Room devotional booklet. And in that article, Willis told his readers why his grandmother ate cold grits for breakfast. Willis said, of course, my grandmother preferred that her grits be hot. But before she could get around to eat them, they always got cold. And then he went into detail describing the beautiful breakfast that his grandmother cooked for her family. For instance, he said, for breakfast, grandmother cooked fresh eggs to order for all of the grandkids. And she also cooked a big plate of hot, crispy bacon and a huge stack of biscuits, homemade biscuits, and put two jars of jelly or jam on the table, one at either end. That way you didn't have to reach so far to get your jelly. And then next to my grandfather's right elbow, she would put a pot of hot coffee on a, colored, a metal, metal colored trivet that she and grandfather enjoyed drinking together. And without fail, every breakfast, grandma made a pot of hot, steamy grits. They were delicious. It was grandmother's practice to dip each person's a bowl of grits when she served them. That way, an individual, each person, could put a slab of butter or a sprinkle of sugar on their grits according to their liking. We grandkids couldn't wait to get our seat on that, on that long wooden bench next to the wall behind her kitchen table. And our family always held hands when grandfather would say the prayer before each meal. The family would sit down and we would begin eating our breakfast after, grandma, uh, after grandfather prayed his prayer. And then grandmother would pick up her devotional booklet and she would read that day's selection from 
the daily devotional booklet, and then she would also read the morning scripture that was suggested to go with it. And after grandmother stopped reading or finished reading, we would stop eating long enough to bow our heads, and grandmother would pray a prayer for her family. And by this time, most of us would have finished eating our breakfast, but grandmother would only just begin to eat hers. As you might guess, by this time, by the time grandmother got around to eating her bowl of grits, they would be cold. Her desire was to lead her family in her, their daily devotions and Baba reading, and this always caused grandma's grits to get cold before she could eat them. Willis Moore said, I remember those breakfasts with a great deal of fondness. I remember sitting at grandmother's table, listening to her read to us, and then praying for us. But most of all, I remember her example of loving us enough to cook a beautiful breakfast and making sure that our mornings together were always special. Now, years later, my main memory of my grandmother is how she pushed those, that bowl of grits aside and pushed her hot breakfast aside to share God's word with us. Sharing God's word was grandmother's priority. My memory of her doing this feeds me to this day. Back then, I was a child. Things didn't seem all that important back then. But now, after the years have rolled by, it is memories of her pushing aside her bowl of grits that helped me recognize the significance of having a daily devotional life. Now you know why Grandmother ate cold grits for breakfast. Those cold grits helped me see the importance of putting God first, not only at breakfast table, but in every aspect of other areas of my life as well. Willis said, my memory of my grandmother pushing aside her bowl of grits in order to share God's word with her family continues to feed me spiritually to this day. What a beautiful example to set for others. Like most of you, I was not born with a silver spoon in my, my mouth. For me and my family, life was demanding at times. <clears throat> it was a struggle for a young family to maintain during the latter days of the rationing brought on by the Second World War. Hard work was necessary if we were to survive. Priorities became an extremely important if we wanted to make ends meet. When I decided to go to college, I knew that no one but myself would have to foot that bill. And so I hit the campus of Elon College, immediately setting out to go find me a part-time job. I was fortunate enough to find enough work during my college career to pay my own way, but I surely didn't have any extra money during those tough days. In my junior year, my mother asked me one day if I had ordered my class ring. I said, no, I can't afford it. And much to my surprise, she handed me an envelope saying, I want you to have a college ring. I want you to have that ring. And when I opened that envelope that she handed to me, there were enough $2 bills that my mother had saved to buy my college ring. Knowing how she had sacrificed to save this money made that ring even more special. Surely, each of you could tell me how of sacrifices others have made on your behalf, and these sacrifices and how they warmed your heart. 
just as my mother's envelope warmed my heart that day. I'm confident that you have had similar experiences. And I'm confident that you understand that there must have been a strong bond between Jesus and those disciples whom he called to follow him. These disciples looked up to Jesus. After all, he had called each one of them personally to come follow him. Then for the better part of the next three years, they sat at his feet, listening to his parables and to him teach. And time and time again, he, he would try to prepare them for what was coming, the impending suffering and the possibility and the death that was to come his way. But they didn't understand what he was talking about. They were confused. How could a man with such a magnificent powers and such a loving spirit as Jesus face suffering and death? Within this context, remember, Jesus had just celebrated the Passover, the Passover meal with his friends. He had just washed their feet as an act of servanthood. He had foretold his betrayal about how Judas was about to carry out for a few co uh, coins. And then he predicted Peter's denial of him. Then Jesus added these words of hope. He said to his friends, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you and will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Have you ever noticed how hardship has a way of getting our attention? Look at the chaos our society is going through at this time. Very few, after facing a trial of significance, ever come out of a crisis the same way we enter it. Jesus understood this and tried to prepare his friends for the road that was ahead of them. Jesus wanted the disciples to know, if you have faith, you can overcome worry. Jesus sensed the disciples' uneasiness and, the, and their confusion when Judas got up and left that table in that, from that upper room to com complete his mission of betrayal. To others, the others remaining there, Jesus said, where I am going, you cannot come, but let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. I want you to try to sense the tension that must have been around that table that evening. I'm thinking that the tension was so thick that you could cut it with a knife. When Jesus said, in my father's house, there is a place for troubled hearts. There is room for you. Do not let your or hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's house. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come for you so that you will always be where I, with me wherever I am. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, no, we don't know the way, Lord. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? Then Jesus said plainly, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through, through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you know him 
and you have seen him. Philip spoke up and said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you all this time, and yet you still don't know me and know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show you the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you see, have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask anything in my name. And I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. When Jesus said this to them, when he said, In my Father's house there are many mansions, many rooms. Be honest now. Do you really think the disciples understood that before they could enjoy those many rooms or that mansion, they would have to endure misery? Do you think they understood what was in store for them? In the modern, the words of the modern cliches, we say, there can be no gain without pain, no triumph without trial, no crown without a cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. Do we really need Mother's Day to remind us that love means sacrifice? Eating cold grits is not the only thing a loving mother or grandmother has done for her family. This is also the nature of our loving God. Who is so callous? Who is so indifferent? that they would not respond to a, to a loving response or a loving sacrifice as what our Lord has done for us. Thomas said, We have no idea where you are going, Lord. How can we know the way? Do you think Jesus, or Thomas understood what Jesus said to him when Jesus said to him, Thomas, I am the way? I am the truth. I am the light. If you want to go where I am, follow me. Why can't and why couldn't and why didn't these men see Jesus, see him as being the way? And all that they had to do was to follow him. Here is the mistake that many make. The mistake that many who call themselves Christian make. They act as if they need a passport to enter the kingdom of heaven. They think that if they belong to the right church, to the right group of people, and if they observe the right rituals and say the right words and believe the right things, they will be guaranteed a reservation in God's mansion. Jesus said clearly, there's only one way to heaven. You don't have to have a passport. It is through him. Jesus said, I am the way. The only way to God is through me. My friends, there's more and knowing Jesus than simply knowing a few things or a few facts about him. This is where we misunderstand who Jesus is. And this is where we miss the boat. Little children even know where Jesus was born. 
They know his mother's name. They can tell you how Jesus learned the carpenter's trade from Joseph. They know how Jesus traveled about healing people and preaching sermons. But do they know Jesus as the Savior, God's Son? They know a few facts that they have gleaned by listening to others talk about him. But have we ever hope, but if we ever hope to know Jesus as the Spirit of the living God, then we must let Jesus dwell in our hearts. A little girl, while playing, suffered a cut over her right eye. Her father took her to the emergency room for treatment. The cut was not that severe, but its location made it necessary that it should be fixed. The doctor came in and examined her and finally said to the father and to the little girl, I need to put a couple of stitches there to close that cut. But he said, I have a problem. I don't want to give her an anesthetic because of her age. She's too young. And he explained to the little girl that it might hurt. And he asked if she, he, uh, she thought he, uh, she could stand the pain. She thought about what the doctor had said to her, and then she said, I think I can if Daddy holds my hand. Her father took his daughter in her lap, put his arms around her, and held her tightly. The doctor did his thing, fixed her cup, and she never flinched. Her father could not have possibly kept her from feeling the pain of those stitches, but his presence enabled her to endure the pain those stitches caused. We can say the same thing about the disciples. Time was fast approaching when they would soon split up and travel in different directions all over the world to proclaim the gospel. Jesus would not physically be with them but he told, uh, when they told other people about this man. But Jesus want, wanted the disciples to know that they were not alone. His hand would be in their hand. This made the difference when they went out into the world. Who could not welcome having such a friend as Jesus? A few years ago, Chuck Swindoll, and some of you may know him as an author, wrote a book, his book entitled, Laugh Again. And in that book, he said, about 20 years after his mother's death, he found that book that belonged to his mother. He said, I couldn't help but be, be moved and have special memories of mom when I thumbed through those pages because my mother had written in the margin of many of those pages and her words became powerful and made a great impression on me all these years later. Chuck said, I turned to the last page of that book and there I found in my mother's handwriting where she had written, finished reading this May 8, 1958. This started a whole flood of memories for me. I recalled where I was and what I was doing in May 1958, Chuck Swindoll said. When my mother finished reading that book, I was a Marine stationed on a tiny island in the South Pacific. It was that month that I had started writing my own journal. The Lord had convinced me that I was to be in his service. And I began to prepare myself for the ministry that same time that Mother was finished, had finished reading that book. Chuck said, as I looked back over those pages, I found reference after another, one after another, of my mother's prayers that where she had sent up for me. I could tell from the notes in the margin of that book that my mother was concerned about my spiritual welfare. That afternoon, sitting in my study, 
reading my mother's book and recalling those precious memories, I couldn't help but be grateful for the way God had led me and blessed me, so I bowed my head and thanked him for his sustaining grace. And I wept with gratitude. Chuck Swindoll said, I was moved by my mother's sacrifice and her example. I was moved by my mother's quiet way. Her example helped lead me to God. How will our children remember us? Well, they remember us with a bowl of grits pushed aside, sitting there getting cold while we are reading our daily devotions? Will they remember our concern for their well, uh, spiritual welfare? You know, God has created every one of us for a purpose. Every life has a goal. We are created to travel through life toward a glorious end. And Jesus says that that glorious end is through him. Abraham Lincoln was once having a, a heavy argument with an opponent, political opponent. Lincoln said to him, my good man, how many legs does a cow have? His opponent answered, four, of course. That's right, said Lincoln. Now suppose uh, you call the cow's tail a leg. How many legs would that cow have now? Why, five, his opponent said. Lincoln says, that's where you're wrong. Calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Calling someone a follower of Jesus when they don't even know the man doesn't make that person a follower at all. If you want to know Jesus, you must let Jesus in your heart, and you must let him have a say in, as to how you treat others. In closing, let me say, Happy Mother's Day. And may I invite you to have a bowl of cold grits with me? Let us pray. Father, we praise you for all the different ways we experience your love. Through your spoken word, through the kindness of others, through the sacrifices others make on our behalf, through the daily struggles of our loving parents, and, and most of all, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for caring enough to prepare a place for us and for coming for us. Forgive our sins and show us this better way. In Jesus' name, we make this our prayer. Amen.